So this is my plan for right now is to continue making people better people because it's like a calling. I didn't know that I had this calling or this mission in life. So I am, I have an obligation and I'm going to keep doing this thing. So it's the, uh, you know, with the basic dude stuff, with the workout, with doing podcasts like this, just with chatting with people, you know, spreading enthusiasm, positivity, because there's too much, too much negativity out there. Yeah. Negativity is volatile, and it's uh, it can be, you know, uh, malignant. And so I am, um, I'm going to continue with my mission. I don't know where it came from or how I have been assigned this mission, but I accept it with great humility, and um, I will continue. And and I have to figure out other ways to. Um, to spread my to spread my word welcome to another episode of the kick cage and please welcome to the show the legendary pat mac pat mac how are you sir great man thank you for having me here uh pl- it's always a pleasure i love doing stuff like this and especially if it can help somebody out so exactly. rock and roll. thank you kindly um i'd like to start off um before you join the military uh talking pre-age 15 you describe yourself as a very different person as to what you are now. Can you just tell us about the the young man that you were at that time? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, yeah, prior to what I call my metamorphosis, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was kind of quirky. I was, uh, and I still am, curious and creative. Um, and, you know, I've had a bunch of hobbies, but they weren't, hobbies that uh that were popular you know stuff like bird watching and i did a lot of artwork and i played the violin and uh, i would ride a unicycle i wanted to be like in the circus you know and juggle and ride a unicycle um just a gent i was a very gentle uh kid uh curious creative and uh gentle kid so yeah that was me some time ago a different lifetime absolutely um now y- your older brother um almost probably helped you change the way you were at that point because um old brother he was quite a bully towards you mm-hmm. uh and he went away for a bit and one of your neighbors sort of recommend going into wrestling was it wrestling that really brought the confidence uh out of you and, and give you that warrior sort of spirit yeah no doubt I, I was so fortunate to have this one mentor and uh i delivered his paper um the first thing he started doing was um he he had a he had a he was a black belt he was a martial artist black belt taekwondo so we would uh do like slap fighting in his backyard he would just show me the basics he was very good about it he wasn't beating me up or anything he was just saying hey man you know you need to know how to defend yourself um and i was probably around 14 15 at the time uh and and so every day after I would deliver his paper, we'd go in his backyard for like 10 minutes because it was on my route and do a little slap fight. Um, and that right there, you know, helped build confidence because it's similar to like, you know, boxing. So sparring, right? So you get these intangibles from sparring. It's that zone awareness, fear management, spontaneity, non-telegraphic motion, of which I had none, zero of those. But the more you spar, the more you start developing those things, right? Those intangible qualities. Uh, and, and especially the fear management thing, you know, because every once in a while he'd make contact. So we weren't fist fighting. We were just slap fight, you know, you know, the deal is just slap fighting. So similar to sparring with boxing, but we didn't have gloves and mouthpieces and such. So it was just kind of a slap fight. He taught me some, some kicks because it was Taekwondo. And then he recommended also, Hey, get involved in sports and school and, and, um, and, talked about the wrestling and my dad loved this guy man because uh uh my dad didn't want dad's dad's they have to be careful to push in a certain direction you know what i mean they have to be careful they have to let you develop into your own person so my dad couldn't push me into sports and i know he wanted to uh but this guy did and uh yeah man that was the 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 beginning of a new me when I started wrestling. How did you feel 
when you started wrestling? Did you did you realize that there was going to be a change within you at that point? Uh, my first year, absolutely not. I just I was happy to be a part of something. I because I sucked, man. I wasn't. Too, <laughs> I mean, I think I started. Uh, like a 134 pound weight class and senior year I was 172. Um, so I started at 134 and just, I, I sucked, but I stuck with it. I, I just, I wasn't a, um, I wasn't a natural born quitter. See up until that point, I still hadn't quit anything ever. You know what I mean? Yeah. I never quit uh, little stuff, whether it was, um, you know, odd jobs or, uh, stuff at school. I never quit. Um, and then my second year of wrestling, I won one match, one, but I remember the feeling, you know, that first victory. It was the first time I was ever victorious of anything, really anything that I worked for. I mean, not being lucky, but this is something that I did. You know, I worked for this. And, and so that was my first like real, um, uh, win you know victory micro victory and i wanted more of that feeling <laughs> especially because it was i wasn't a physical kid uh i was just an average boy who played outside and build forts and stuff like that but i wasn't real physical and then before my third year i worked hard you know before my junior year in high school i worked hard and went to the college in town and wrestled with the the collegiate athletes and they were uh very open arm you know very embracing very welcoming because they wanted to mentor you know the younger generation of wrestlers uh and that was such an eye opener and man my 11th or my junior and senior year in high school I couldn't I couldn't be beat but I worked real hard for it. You know, I, I did, I put in the extra miles, literally put in the extra miles, put in the extra weightlifting. Um, uh, yeah. So that was definitely a big change for me in my life. So that was your metamorphosis going from a bird watching, uh, young adult to a, a contact sport uh, adolescent. Mm -hmm. Now, 11th grade, you started getting interested in the military. What sparked that off? Um, I, 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 it was, it was the wrestling, it was the physical challenge and being victorious and a part of a team. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there was a lot of similarities because you got to be wrestling requires a lot of discipline. You have to watch your weight. You have to cut your hair. You know, you have to trim your fingernails, all that. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's unlike there are other sports where, um, you know, you could, if you were, uh, not saying that kids can grow beards, but some could, and you had to make sure that you were clean shaven and that your hair was a, at a certain length. Uh, and you had to work not only with the team, but put the extra work in if you wanted to better yourself, if you wanted to level up. Uh, so that was definitely what, uh, encourage me plus my neighborhood was full of a lot of vets my dad was an army vet there was a guy next door i i emulated and kind of idolized he was uh he was a navy uh just a, you know a sailor and um the guy across the street from me was a world war ii infantryman you know so and and there was a lot of that in the neighborhood i i think i had three on my cul-de-sac three world war ii vets yeah, Mr. Andre Kirklo and Marco. Uh three three pol three Polacks. World War II vets, all different branches of service. So so that was encouraging too, you know, they kind of uh, I I just I respected them. You know, they were the type of guys who um when it snowed, they were shoveling other people's driveways. You know, these old guys, when there, a car got stuck in the cul-de-sac, they were out there with salt and pushing it, you know, to uh, to a better uh, to a better location. Uh, they just worked. They worked hard and they set good examples. So so between the wrestling and the culture of my cul-de-sac. <laughs> Sounds like you, you had some very good foundations laid there for yep. uh, for your future. Talk me through walking into the recruiter, because obviously you, you've got the, the army, you've got the Navy there, all influencing you. Mm -hmm. What was it that spurred you in the recruiters to to go down your down the path? Was it Army, Airborne, Ranger? Well, I, I went to all of the recruiters because I really didn't know, you know, what was what. 
and what I can do. So there was kind of a, a shopping center that had like a recruiter row. You know, they were just one small uh, room after the other, um, you know, with a storefront and posters and stuff on the window, you know, recruiting posters. And uh, I just walked into every one of them with the stu- with a stupid question. And that was, hey, what's the hardest thing I could do in the Navy? What's the hardest thing I could do in the Marine Corps? What's the hardest I could do a thing that I could do in the Air Force? You know, and they all had great answers because there's special ops in every one of those that are really, really quality. You know, um, and but the Army had two things going for it. Number one, um, kind of the 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 fastest possible track to the road of badassery. And they had the coolest recruiting posters, man. <laughs> they had an Airborne Ranger and a Green Beret ne- next to each other. And I was looking at those going, whoa. You know, the Green Beret all camied up with ropes over his shoulder. And I, I just thought it was the neatest thing. Knife on his side. And they had, the Army had this pro- program at the time called, um, it, uh, it was brand new, like a Special Forces Baby program. Uh, the X-Ray series. and. Um, uh, so I, I told the recruiter, that's what I want. And he ginned up the paperwork. And before I signed it, I told my dad, because my dad didn't know that I was going to the, to the recruiters. And I was still, like you said, I was still in 11th grade. So this would have been, you know, like called the uh, delayed entry program. You know, um, it was right at the end of my junior year. Um, matter of fact, I think it was, yeah, it was that summer vacation, you know, between, between this, uh, junior and senior year. And when I told my dad, he was like, whoa, 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 pump the brakes, pump the brakes, pump the brakes. Don't sign yet. Did you sign? I said, no. He said, don't sign yet. And um, he said, let's let's get my lawyer down there <laughs> 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 to check the paperwork. I was like, all right, hell yeah. And the lawyer was uh, special forces as well at one t- time, you know, earlier in his life. Um, and the recruiter made some changes when the lawyer came in. Made some changes to the paperwork. Wow. Yep. So I I was fortunate that my dad had my, you know, best intentions in mind and was covering my six. Um, so obviously, um you you had this delayed entry going into the forces. Obviously, you were still at school at the time. Going through basic training, how much did you grow as a man? Uh, and was there some good examples of leadership that helped you during that process? You know, um, I, I really found my calling, you know, going through infantry basic training. I, I was like, this is what I was made for. I knew it immediately. Now, like everybody, though, I was scared shitless, bro. You know, I mean, <clears throat> because it's a job of a, dr- of, a Jesus, of a drill instructor, right, to, um, to scare the shit out of you. It's all theater. Grace. Stop. Sorry about that. That's fine. <laughs> Nobody's here. I don't know what she's barking at. So, <laughs> um, but it's their job to, to really scare the freaking shit out of you and, and just humble the hell out of you. And, uh, uh, I was thriving in that environment, man, thriving. I was, I was crushing everybody in PT. Um, I was winning like push up and pull up contests because man, I was, re- I went in really fit extremely fit i went into that because even after in my senior year after wrestling i was training i was going to the gym every day i was running two miles every day um i was just eat, eating like crazy so uh i went from wrestling 172 in the end of the season my senior year in like february and when i joined the army i was uh 185 when wow. i first joined the army so i had bulked up significantly i was strong i was really fit and um i found that um that right there you know physical ability can really boost one's confidence Mm -hmm. which can also boost one's performance you know comp you're confident you could perform better so i was crushing all the tasks you know anything they gave me to uh uh any of the basic training tracks, whether it was drill and ceremony or, you know, assembly and disassembly of equipment, whatever it was, uh, memorization of, um, you know, general orders, that kind of stuff. Um, 
I was crushing that stuff and ended up uh, uh, being one of the, um, like, uh, just my class leaders and ended up uh, being distinguished honor graduate out of that. Uh, what is it like? I forget what infantry basic is. It's like 12 weeks or something like that. But I ended up being the uh, distinguished honor graduate. How did that boost your confidence? Because obviously you, you, through this process, you've had a confidence boost after confidence boost. Mm -hmm. we, were you still grounded at this stage, being a young man, having all this uh, confidence and vigor? Were you still grounded? Yeah, I, I, I was at that point. Uh, I was still grounded because um, I, I wasn't like head, head and heels above everybody. I was just, I was, I was, um, you know, top of the heat, but not far. You know, it wasn't like I was surpassing everybody by an in insurmountable means. It was just a little bit, but I was still ahead and passing. So I was still pretty grounded um, and pretty humble. Plus, I was nervous because I still had a long road in front of me. Yeah. You know, I still had airborne school to go to. So I was nervous again. And if I if I made that, I, then I had the special forces course to go to. So I still had to keep my mouth shut and stay pretty humble. So it was it uh, Fort Bragg you moved on to for your, your first jump training? Uh, Fort Benning for the jump training. Fort, so it Fort was Benning, right sorry. there. That's where infantry basic was. So yep. I just went down the street and, you know, lived in a new barracks for for a jump school. And how did you find that moving away from the basic training and start learning the the tools of the trade, so to speak? Yeah, you know, I, 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 it, it, it's funny because... um. Even though it's supposed to be a harder school, you had a little bit more freedom, hmm. you know, with, with, with jump school, you had a little bit more freedom and they gave you just a little more responsibility. So I like the trickle effect there, you know, uh, because you weren't imprisoned like you are in basic training. You could do stuff at night. You know, you could go to the, like the, 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 the post club and have a beer and those kind of things. So you had more liberty and more responsibility so finishing all your your training and you're going to your your first section your first squad um joining that group of men uh trying to establish yourself in a, a new peerage group mm -hmm. how did you find that uh so of course of course i went to uh first special forces group out of fort lewis washington and I'm the youngest, most inexperienced guy on an A-team. But guess what? I got to land myself on an A-team. Because a lot of the privates, the SF babies, yeah. they weren't putting them on A-teams. They were on B-teams. They were in um, commo support. They were, uh, you know, working headquarters jobs until they got a little bit of rank and experience behind them. But I got myself... Um, a slot on an A team and um the most the youngest, the most inexperienced guy. And I was the the humility started all over again. Yeah. Because my team sergeant was a Vietnam vet. Uh everybody on that team had a lot of prior experience. I mean not tons, but like five, six years, you know, yeah. of of infantry time, of ranger battalion time. So what did I have? nothing <laughs> not a zilch goose egg i had no experience whatsoever so i had to work my ass off and earn earn that right to have a slot on the a team and you know uh work for the betterment of me so i could be an asset on the team versus just some dumbass kid liability hmm. how, how important was it to you um personally as a as a a mental influence to try and gain that uh, peerage support, not just just for your job role, but for your own personal. How, how was the? Uh, say, re repeat that once more. I want to understand what I'm answering here. How did it feel for you personally, mm -hmm. and uh, as a mental boost to to gain that peerage rather than just to do it for uh, the job role itself? Uh. Yeah, it was important, man. Um, you know, because it's not just, it's not about the job. It's about look at getting your buddy six yeah. and making sure that you, um, you can contribute value to a team of guys who have lots of value. 
So I was very motivated to, um, to learn new stuff. I was any opportunity for a school that came my way. I was jumping at it. For instance, I like immediately reclassed job specialties when a slot came down. I said, all right, well, I'm a, I'm a weapons sergeant and there is a special forces communicator slot for school coming down, raise your hand. Um, so I reclass the next one. There's a combat dive school slot who wants it. Raise your hand. There's a halo school slot coming down the pipe who wants it. Raise your hand. So by the time I was 22 years old, I had two special forces MOSs and I was what was con considered a whiskey nine. So both halo and combat dive qualified. Wow. That's, that's one hell of a fast thing. tracking, man. Fast tracking. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so you went to Europe um, uh, as part of your getting your toes wet into into military life. Just talk us through what it felt like for you the first time going out of country. Uh, yeah, so well, it wasn't my first time going out of country because um, while it was my three years in first group, we did a lot of, because it was peacetime army, we, we did a lot yeah. of FID, you know, the FID yeah. missions, the Foreign Internal Defense. And I worked a lot in Thailand, Philippines um that area of the world so after three years of being a first group i got recruited to do this uh cold war stuff i don't, yeah. I don't know what the hell is going on i was like well, right, sure raise your hand you know because it's all about leveling up you know what i mean you want to keep leveling up level up level up instead of just getting stuck in a rut and and um and existing in this mundane life where you're just accepting mediocrity even though you're a special ops guy you could still be mediocre. You know, you, you could still just say, eh, I'm good. I got mine. I don't need to go any further. Man, any opportunity that came my way, I was raising my hand. I wanted to level up, level up, level up. And that uh, that was a big eye opener because, you know, anytime you level up, you had more and more freedom. Also more and more responsibility, though. You know, which which are cool things, you know, that freedom yeah. and responsibility uh, kind of go hand in hand. Um, and that was uh, that was like adulthood for me <laughs> going into <laughs> going into that. Those two jobs I had in Europe, I had two of them, uh, but that was like entering adulthood. I was like, holy shit, man. Now I really get and and you're constantly learning new things, new tricks of the trade, new schools, language uh, uh trade craft street craft all this stuff you know so it was a big eye opener for me what was it like um being in germany in that time obviously the berlin wall was still there uh mm -hmm. you still had east and west germany you know uh controlled by the soviet union at the time mm -hmm. what what was the atmosphere like there and uh, and how did that make you feel you know when you lived in when you live in berlin you're in this tiny little island within a country you know what i'm saying it's so it's an island within a country and you really don't even recognize the fact that you're consumed uh that the the city in which you live is consumed by a communist country but yet this berlin west berlin total freedom right total freedom um but when you cross the border it's like wow wow you know that was the eye opener there yeah. Because you had to do biz dealings in, you had to do stuff in uh, West Germany as well. You had to go from uh, West Berlin, drive through East Germany, and go into West Germany to do like jump training or whatever it is, just different yeah. demo training, this kind of thing. Um, and it was like driving into a black and white movie. You know, when you're going through cities like Dresden and stuff like that, it's like, damn man bleak 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 it's commie you know so yeah. bleak bleak is shit man so it was it was um it was it was quite the culture shock for me did you have any uh hairy moments obviously crossing the border uh being a u.s military personnel did you have any hairy moments going from west to east um no not during the travels not dur doing that um uh, a lot of side eye, a lot of um, kind of dick measuring contest, you know, with guards and soldiers and stuff like that. Um, a lot of freak eye fucking, you know, and you, it was just unnerving a little bit, you know, it was very unnerving. 
I, 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 I got into a lot of hairy moments. Um, my second job in Germany, cause I got recruited to work in this uh, unit called the United States military liaison mission, USMLM, uh, of Potsdam, Ostdeutschland. So, Pot- so uh, working now in Soviet East Germany and, um, a lot of hairy moments there, man, because you, you, you you were spying in the Soviet army, but the thing is, it was more like, it wasn't covert. It was overt. You know, you, you, you had a cover for action, cover for status. We were a liaison unit to the Soviet army and they knew what the hell we were doing. It wasn't like it was geheim, you know, it wasn't like a, it was a secret. Um, but, uh, and they had carte blanche to do whatever the hell they wanted in the event they caught you doing something goofy, dudes were executed by Soviets, executed Americans. Uh, so, yeah, some hairy times there. And but man, I'm so freaking fortunate that I got to be a part of that. Whew. Yeah, were you, were you there in '89 when the wall came down? Then yes, yep, I was there uh, it, when the wall came down, and '91 is when I left. That was during reunification. Yeah. Yep, what, so was what was there. it like being there witnessing that wall coming Dude, down? Dude, it was fantastic, season, man. Yeah. It was fantastic. It was um now the thing is though, I was just witness to a significant part of history, right? Yeah. But I can't imagine it was what it was like for the people who lived in Berlin, the people who lived in East Berlin, the people who lived in East Germany. So I had to live vicariously through them, you know, and just and take it all in and look at you know, people embracing from one side of the border to the other and the confusion on the Eastern, the East Germany folks faces, the East Germans, you know, it was like, it was like elation mixed with confusion. It was really neat. Where, where did you go from from Berlin? Was that when you started going for selection for the unit? Yep. That's when I went to selection for the unit. Cause once again, you got to level up. What do you do now? You just, you just finished with these two badass Cold War jobs. Yeah. What now? What's the next step? So that's the highest step and probably the, like the highest step in the U.S. military. That was it right there. That's it. What was the selection process like for that? Man, you know what? I tell people um, <clears throat> when I run into guys in the military, uh, special ops infantry guys and they're in their younger and they know who I am. And they say, yeah, I'm thinking about going to a uh, selection for the unit. I said, bro, don't think the second you have the opportunity, get to a recruiter and just go. I said, I swear to God, man, I, I tell people this. If my phone rang right now and somebody called up from the unit and said, Hey man, do you want to do an experiment? Go through selection next fall. I would say, hell yeah, <laughs> I would not make it at this point in my life <laughs> but it's it's a it's a it, this sounds stupid but it's a good time yes the attrition rate is massive yeah but it's a good it's a good time it is hard as shit but you know you're not getting yelled at you're not sleep deprived you're not starving you just got to think a lot and and exercise mountains of resolve and you got to have heart and chutzpah, you know moxie and um, you've got to be able to fail quickly because you're going to fail, you know, and you can't spend that much time failing. You got to spend that much time failing and you got to be able to make timely decisions. Uh, so it's just a good freaking. So I tell guys, it's like, hey, man, make it or not, just go. Just go. if you because just getting a slot. It's like not they don't give away slots. You know, I think the recruiters, they they they, they screen like 2000 packets. Uh, every six months and out of those 2000 there's only a couple hundred that get a slot even yeah and these are all qualified dudes and out of those couple hundred you know uh, maybe a hundred of them can actually show up because they got others they had deployments or they just broke a leg or whatever it is and out of that hundred i don't know 15 will make that and out of that 15 they have to go to six months of, of otc and then another five will drop so um the the process is cool the process works you know they and they all do right all the process for all yeah. all the worlds not just the u.s special ops but all the world special ops have a very unique selection process and um and that's one that i tell guys it's not like you're going to be brutalized it's not combat dive school <laughs> you know where you might drown <laughs> 
there's a really good chance you could drown in that school. Uh, it's 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 a different it's a different th- thing. It's it's they give you just once again freedom, responsibility. Yeah. You got so much freedom in that course. Left and right limits are a mile wide, but damn, it's easy to screw up. <laughs> that that's when you got to have the self discipline to to bring those left and right limits in and yeah, concentrate man. on what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Now, um, obviously, from boot camp to this point, going in for section for the unit. What training per, uh, process do you feel taught you the most resilience, the most mental resilience? Mm. You know what? I'm going to I'm going to say uh, as far as mental resilience go, it's going to be the hardest physical schools. Right. It, for me and both uh, selection for the unit and combat dive school. Talk about mental resilience, man, because shit ain't easy. They're hard. I mean, they're two different types of hard, right? selection for the unit and and um and combat dive school because this one combat dive school that is brutal bro because the water is the ultimate equalizer yeah that's some humbling shit right there man and it don't play it doesn't care that you're in it (laughs) you know and it will consume you and eat you alive but man those schools really anybody that you know when i run into a, a, a spec ops guy and and i know he's combat dive qualified i'm like hell yeah man good for you because that one is tough man it's it's one of the toughest military schools there is as far as physical schools yeah uh i like to fast forward a little bit to when the twin towers were struck where were you uh when the news came out and how did that make you feel i was on a range called 19 bravo standing on top of a cqb maze in the northwest corner of the maze (laughs) i know exactly where i was you know but uh at that point when i was standing up there um a student broke a piece of gear and he was one of my i was his um counselor and i said hey bro don't worry about it you don't have to go down i'll run down and get this dx you know this piece of equipment because you need to stay in here. You need to see what's going on. You need to look at the one eye. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so I ran down to the main building and went into the supply. And uh, the the, uh, the supply guy was watching a TV. You know, there's a counter there, you know, a little counter, a little window. Yeah. And I said, hey, bro, how's it going? And he said, what you got? And I said, I need to DX this thing. And, and I said, what's going on here? He goes, hey, a, a plane just hit the uh, one of the towers. And, you know, at that point, everybody thought, there was reports that it was a Cessna, that this was an accident. Yeah. Um, so it was nothing. It was just a really bad accident at that point. Everybody thought the same thing until that second one went in and I watched it live. Man, that feeling, right? I just got goosebumps all over me just thinking about it. So watching that go live because the S4 guy was glued to the TV and all he went, he was just going, he didn't even turn to look at me. You know, he was just going, holy shit holy shit holy shit and then the, you know the news broadcasters yeah. they were all going oh 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 all right ladies and gentlemen this this was not an accident this isn't this was intentional and that was not a cessna he said that i remember the news uh announcer saying that was a bigger plane you know that was like a, a 737 or something that was not a cessna uh because the first one nobody really got a good look at you know on the ground yeah, because it just went boom, and people were like, "Whoa, call the fire department! This sucks." So at that time, right there, um, got that guy's equipment, boogied back up range, and I, I called a, an admin timeout from CQB and explained my version of it. You know, I was like, "Hey, man, this just freaking happened. Don't know anything." Uh, and then the unit shut down, uh, like about two hours later i think it was yeah you know we just went to training training doesn't stop i think it was two hours later um the unit called a halt because they had enough intel because uh you had the other you had the pentagon one after that you know so uh and gave us a, a the whole unit kind of a dump on an intel dump on what we knew at the time how how did that affect the mood there uh otc because obviously at that point you were teaching 
did the did what you were teaching change or because you're already teaching at such uh you know a, a tier one level it just stayed as it was yeah i get asked that a lot you know was there like a, a um a ramp up in sense yeah. of urgency mm -mm. everything stayed the same man you can't you couldn't train any harder you know it wasn't like we said well shit man we're probably getting deployed next week let's train harder it was as <laughs> you're doing it as hard as you can, you know, for those six months of OTC. So, um, but the thing is, I know it changed people's mindset, right? Yeah. You know, it changed everybody's mindset. You're thinking, well, let me just sure, let me just make sure that I got all my shit together. You know, that I've got uh, crossing my T's, dotting my I's, that my gear is all good, that I have nothing freaking busted up. Um, that my body isn't busted up, that my, um, my home life is secure, that everything's, you know, in a nice, neat, tidy package. So in the event we get a deployment order, um, you know, I'm not, I don't have that regret of, damn it, man, I should have, would have, could have. You, you were deployed to Iraq twice, but you, you didn't get to go to Afghanistan. Right. Um, how... How did that make you feel not going to Afghanistan? Because obviously, it, yeah, for a lot of people, going there was for a sense of retribution to to fight the people that you know attacked American soil. Yeah, did it you know concern you that you you didn't get to go to Afghanistan? Yeah, it it, it didn't concern me, but I, but I definitely um, you know, it was uh, it was real like bittersweet. It was um. I needed to, I needed to retire yeah. uh, for personal reasons. Uh, I had, I had a really bad situation at home and I don't need to go into it, but it was, it was bad. And um, <clears throat> my kids were being adversely affected. Yeah. I mean, like it was horrible for them. Uh, uh, so I just got distracted. My dog's barking again at what? I don't know. <laughs> Um, but, uh, so, you know, afterwards just hearing the stories that my buds have had yeah. and everything, I was like, dang, man, I wish I got to go to Afghanistan. Yeah. I had a lot of regret, uh, retiring at, uh, 22 years in, um, but, uh, but I had to do it at the time, you know, I had to yeah. for the sake of my kids, which sucked, but, but, you know, I, 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 I did a lot, you know, in those 22 yeah. years. So I, did, I didn't have, um, you know, a lot of uh, regret about retiring because uh, I wasn't thinking, oh, man, I should have gone this route or that or I could have been this or that because I got pretty freaking high up there. You know, I, I did. I, I built myself into, um, you know, something that was pretty unique within the special ops ranks. So, uh, yeah. I, I, but I was bummed not to go to Afghanistan, no doubt. Um, so let's just build up to 2013 because I know 2013 wasn't a wasn't a great year. So just backtracking uh, to the point where you left the military, you mm -hmm. come out to to be a stable father for your children. Yep. How did that? How did you find the the transition from military to civilian life, and how easy was it for you to find employment after twenty two years uh, a high level of U.S. military? All right. So as far as uh, two thousand thirteen goes, I, I can I call that my worst year, my best year. But let's go backwards. I retired yeah. in oh five. Yeah. So in oh five, uh, the transition was easy because I I got hired before I retired. So I got hired uh, to work a, a job with other retired military guys for a corporation. And it was low-hanging fruit, you know? And I wasn't happy. I didn't have job satisfaction. Um, and in 2010, started um, my own company, 2010. But the, the, the transition was easy as far as employment went. But I found myself going into a deeper, darker place the more that time lapsed because I missed all of it. I just missed yeah. the, the connection, the camaraderie, uh, the challenges, the purpose, the meaning, 
all of that stuff. I missed it. I craved it. And there was nothing that was filling that void. Um, I went into a long bout of deep, dark depression. I mean, years. And I didn't even recognize it as such. Uh, Cause you, 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 you don't tell when number one, when you, when you're in a bad state of depression, you don't know why you don't, there's not one thing that triggers it. Number two, you don't want to admit to anybody people with the, they, they don't tell people that they're dealing with shit, that they're freaking drinking themselves uh, drunk every day. They don't, they, they don't tell people that. Um, and that was me. Uh, uh, but I was able to, I was able to pull myself out of it. And it, it in yeah, 2013, I call my worst year, my best year. It was like, so it, everything came crumbling down, crashing down and in a, in a, in a variety of aspects, it was like the, the peak of my depression, but I pulled myself out of it. Right. So 2013 is another metamorphosis in my life. It was another new chapter. I've had several new chapters in my life, several. Uh, the other thing it was, um, I was three years into running my own business, doing a lot of government contracts. And then in February of 2013 is when this thing called sequestration hit. So all funding cut for training and travel, which meant I was out of work for eight months, already in massive credit card debt because I was also separated at that point. I got separated in 2013. I, um, can't pull myself out of depression in 2013. I I went into massive debt, massive. Uh, But later in the year, I met my current wife. I met Rebecca. Uh, And everything started to kind of balance out, you know, balanced out. I was working out again. You know, I I found new vigor, new fire, and new meaning, new purpose. I had to readjust my strategy as far as business strategy goes. Shit can all the government contract stuff and start just really uh, marketing me as a brand. That's when I started really pushing like Pat Mac brand. And my wife helped me discover social media because I didn't know what it was, man. You know, I didn't know any of that stuff. And so we really started pushing it pushing it at that point and so it was it was a fantastic year because it was absolutely horrible and absolutely great all at the same time and you know when i met her i i told her when when it when we started getting serious i told her i said hey i'm about uh eighty five thousand dollars in debt right now <laughs> and i owned nothing i had nothing i had no tangible assets you know i said but i'm gonna pull out of this i'm gonna pull out of it I'm going to make something of myself, you know? So I, she, she trusted the guy that was in front of her. And, and when you're in that kind of debt and, and when, cause not just, you're also in a deficit. I was in a deficit, not just debt, but a deficit of work. So I had to reinvent myself, reinvent my business strategy. Um, and man, the hustle became real. That's when the hustle became freaking real, like the grind. You know, that's what we call it, right? The grind, because you are grinding your ass off if you want to make something of yourself. You got to put in the freaking miles because later on down the road, you could sit on your ass, you know, sweat equity, you know, freedom through discipline. So for the guys who are entrepreneurs and stuff and they're working their asses off, keep doing it. (laughs) That's right of passage. Because I'm at a place right now, 58 years old, where eh, I'm as busy as I want to be. From that, there's a, there's a lot to unpack there. So if if we just go back to the beginning of that, um, the question would be, how important do you think it would be for a veteran coming into civilian life to find that job that gives them meaning and purpose? It is necessary. It is 100% absolutely necessary. I was just having that conversation with somebody. Um, I like to recognize, and it's not easy to do, military guys, especially, you know, career military guys who have retired, I like to recognize uh, whether or not they've got a connection issue. Um, So I could start talking to them about that kind of stuff. You know, what are you doing now? How are you feeling with it? How are you feeling? Because I know guys that are working for corporations still. 
and uh and they're like yeah you know it's a job um and that right there mm -mm, that's no good man for a career special ops guy you need more than that you need to create you need to be in charge of something you need purpose you need meaning you need to develop you know you need to build stuff you need to build a castle you know instead of going from from um uh rv park to rv park driving your rv around you need to build a castle one rock on top of the other you know s start with that strong ass foundation and can and build it until you've got this structure that is impermeable to anything that comes your way so i try to recognize it and i and i try to tell guys that man i'm working right now as we speak i'm trickling into talking to another couple guys and it's not an easy thing to do because yeah. they're type a's bro they don't want freaking help and what happens yeah. then you know they find themselves in a dark place and shit could get worse after that so it's important to reach out because connection is the cure when it comes to uh guys who have like suffering from depression and that kind of thing they've got to stay connected they've got to be part of a unit they yeah. they've got to construct build purpose meaning they've got to have all those things in their life otherwise they're going to fall flat you know and it's going to be detrimental to their mental state of mind so next and uh obviously saying you that you you admit now that you had depression but what did uh depression look like for you from the inside out and perhaps how others perceived you from the outside in yeah so how people perceive me they didn't know nobody nobody knew dude I, I i how how it was for me i remember um just i'm a very enthusiastic energetic person as you could probably see by my current demeanor and deportment but uh, so I was I big lack of enthusiasm, right? Number one, I'm hobby heavy. I wasn't even going outside. I lived in the bonus room above my garage for almost five years, just so I could stay close to my kids. The, the The marriage was horrible. It was riddled with not on my part, but it was riddled with prescription meds and alcohol. So that is damning. You know that is a, a severe detriment to one's mental state, to the connection between the neuroreceptors so i was living in a dark place i was staying anytime i wasn't on the road i'd just be in that bonus room watching a freaking tv this big you know i wasn't playing music i wasn't going outside i wasn't fishing um and i would start drinking i wasn't getting like hammered but i would start drinking about 11 in the morning jack and cokes i would buy a six pack of plastic bottle cokes pour out half and fill the rest with jack daniels so that way i could walk around anywhere i wanted to and freaking drink in public because i just got a coca-cola here yeah. so i was buzzed all day long and i was throwing in shit like percocets you know as well every once in a while um you know mowing the lawn getting drunk and getting stoned on freaking percocets uh and it was i had to self-realize it and it wasn't easy it was because of my kids that i realized it that's how I figured when I was shit, man. I got an issue. What were, what was the turning point for you? Was it was it your children? Do you, do you yeah. remember the exact moment that you you turned to yourself and went, shit's got to change? Absolutely, one hundred percent. It was a it was a it was a uh, it was a a defining moment that I will never forget because a lot of things happened at one time. It was nine at night. It was January, February, maybe. February, March, uh, uh, February, March. And I was in my bonus room and it's very dim lit. You know, I have one incandescent light bulb. So it's got that nice, like warm yellow hue in the room. And the window is open, little teeny bonus room window. My window is open. And I'm on my, um, my uh, couch with my son at the time. He was just a sweetest, cutest little boy, about five years old. Uh, and, uh, I'm watching TV with him and I'm pretty shit faced at this point. And he's watching the TV. He's oriented this way. And I see something out of the corner of my eye. I look at the window and a screech owl lands right on the windowsill. You know, so it's there because the window's open and it's right there. And he's 
looking inside, looking out, and I nudge my kid. I go, James, real slow, turn and look at the window. And he turns real slow and he grabs my arm and he goes, whoa, you know, he's whispering like that. Whoa, it was really freaking neat because this little guy was right there and he hung out for a little bit and then he flew off and I look at my kid and he, you know, the look in his face, right? The sweet little big gigantic brown eyes. And I said to him at that moment, I said, you know, James, I don't just love you. I am in love with you. And he started crying, you know, just a, a happy cry. And I did too, man. I wept and I'm almost just now I, I got, I felt my eyes well up um, and I put them to bed. And that's when I realized, fuck, fuck, I am screwing up, man. You know, I got to be around for these kids. That's why I freaking got out of the military. And now I'm going down a, a dark path. I got out of the military to save their lives. <laughs> and uh, uh, he, uh, but that was it. So that, that, that night I made a change. I made a, a, a huge attitude adjustment that night. What did, what did you learn in this, in this rebirth? What did you learn about yourself? I remembered who I was. That was the biggest one. Cause I forgot, I forgot. I totally forgot who the fuck am I? Dude. I remembered who I was because the next morning I planned it out. I strategized in my head, you know, that night I went to sleep. I, I set my running shoes by my bed and my, uh, my iPod, um, and some shorts. And I got up early and I said, I'm going to go for, I'm going to work out. No plan. Dude. I ran for, I jogged <laughs> for an hour and a half. I don't know. 12. I don't know how far it was. I got back to my driveway and I was starving, man. You know, I was like, I did not want to go inside though. I call it that the, the house where dreams go to die with the house I was living in. And I stayed in my driveway. I worked out for like another hour, just calisthenics, get up, get down, push up, sit up, you know, dumbbells, just going batshit crazy. And I went, I was going, ah, you know, just screaming, screaming at the sky. And I remembered, I was like, Oh, there I am. You know, I felt the, I felt my, the ignition, you know what I mean? Yeah. It was like, set it off, man, set it off. And whew, that was, that was 13. That was 13. And it wasn't long after that. It was, wasn't long after that where uh, I had a, a local cop talk to me and he said, you got to move the fuck out of there. You are, you're going to come a part of the seams. And I did. <laughs> it, doing that driveway workout is that where you got your inspiration for your instagram because um obviously i'll follow you on instagram and right hell some of those workouts that you do are <laughs> absolutely insane <laughs> you know the, it's so much fun you know doing that stuff uh but once again creativity right yeah so i'm a creative guy and people always ask me where how, who gives you your ideas <laughs> people get ideas for me man i don't know <laughs> Yep. Um, yeah. Where do you come up with these ideas? I think them up, you know, because I want to mix it up because it's got to be interesting, you know, to keep you going. But no, that's not where I got it from. Right. The driveway. That wasn't my inspiration for driveway because I, when I, um, uh, I just went to gyms after that because uh, I wasn't even working out hardly at all. But then I started just hit it hard, you know, like the olden days, like I was a couple years prior like real hard. I just, I found that fire again. I nurtured that fire and turned it into an inferno, man. I freaking, it was a blaze, you know? And, um, but the, the driveway gym inspiration just came from coronation. Right. Everything shut down. I'll never go back to a gym again. The only thing I miss about going to a gym is getting punched in the face and, and, uh, grappling <laughs> with somebody else. Um, so going through that metamorphosis, what advice would you give to a veteran that might be going through the a similar dark moment Perfect. as you went through? Yep. So all the things we talked about, this is a big one now. Uh, and, and guys don't, they, they, they're not going to want to do this. You got to, you got to connect with somebody because you might not real, you might not even realize it, you know, that you're going through a dark place. I did not. And it took that moment of the owl land. How many guys are going to have an owl land on their <laughs> windowsill when their sweet kid is sitting next to them and have that whole thing go on, you know? So that was a self-realization for me. And I was able to pull myself out of it. We're not all that lucky. Yeah. 
So number one, you, you've, you've got to realize it and you, you've got to admit it. You, you don't have to like spill your guts to somebody, but you got to connect with one of your old buds. Just send him a text and the vice versa. A guy like me, I do that for other people. I might see him out and about and they look bummed out. I'm just going to throw him a text. Hey, man, how you doing? Thinking about you today. Simple as that. You don't need any more. You just lay in the groundwork for what, and, and man, in the past, that shit has ballooned. It has blown up. Guys, you know, just with that simple text of somebody I haven't talked to maybe in a couple of years, it turns into a two-hour phone call. And I realize how bad they're doing. Yeah. And so the other thing is I tell them, hey, man, get, number one, get outdoors. Right. Uh, two, you got to work out. Work it, working out is the, it's a cure for everything it really is, but you got to work out. And then, well, how do I get motivated to work out? I said, I don't know, plan a trip, you know, a hiking trip. So you got to put the ruck back on something like that, you know, get in touch with your freaking infantry side, man, you know, put that freaking pain bag back on that big green blood sucking tick and go freaking pound pavement, go in the woods, go for a long ass freaking walk, train for something because meaning purpose, right? Yeah. If you're training for something. And there's, there's foundations out there that do this now for guys like, uh, I'm, uh, sort of, I'm not partnered, but I am in cahoots with, uh, there's one called green beret racing, for instance, and they do that. They give guys purpose and meaning by setting up events and, um, uh, competitions, uh, like cross country skiing, mountain climbing, um, Baja racing, all this kind of stuff. So they need, guys need to find purpose. So you need to stay connected. You got to work out, man. Work out, work out, work out until you pass out, <laughs> you know, how hard until you freaking throw up, you're going to feel good after that yeah. purge. <laughs> and then, um, find something with meaning and it doesn't have to be a job. You know, it doesn't have to, I don't mean build your own business. I could mean, uh, pick up a guitar and learn a song. Uh, uh, it could be, uh, Get you a new freaking gun, go to the range and practice uh, competition bullseye shooting, something like that, yeah. you know, purpose, meaning, because then comes fulfillment. You know, you need that fulfillment. So those are the, those are where I start people. That's some good words of advice. Um, you're also an author. Uh, at, at what point? Did you sit down and, and think, you know, I, I'm going to write a book? Because a few of the veterans I've spoken to previously has used writing uh, as a form of coping, of, of getting things out of their head onto paper, and it, it, it compartmentalizes everything that they've been through. What was it that pointed you in the direction of writing? Uh, securing intellectual property. <laughs> that's all it was for me. <laughs> <laughs> with the first book, with the first book, that's all it was. It was like, oh man, people are plagiarizing my stuff, yeah. you know, my, my training methodology and everything. So it was out of legal necessity, you know, right? So that was, that was it. Second one, Sentinel, I spent a little more time with, and that's, that was during deep, dark depression. Yeah. I was in a dark time. Um, and that gave me focus, man, you know, dumping idea onto paper, just dump it, just dump yeah. it up there. You don't have to be structured, man. I tell guys all the time, if they want to write a book or something, just dump ideas, just dump them, dump them, you know, because um, action, right? That's action. Action yeah. without a plan is way better than a plan with no action, you know, because guys, I'm thinking about writing a book. Do it right now, wherever you are, do it right now. Just start taking notes. You could do it. You, you're all, everybody carries a supercomputer in their pocket. Do it right now. <laughs> What's your fucking excuse? I'm thinking about. I hate that. <laughs> I'm thinking about doing this. Do it right now. How important is it, uh, like you were saying about that, Greenberry Racing, how important is it to have these veteran associations, uh, veteran companies like Eagles and Angels and, yep. you know, doing stuff like the Murph Challenge? How important is that to, A, uh, in your opinion, a raise awareness for TBI's mental health or just veteran stories, and B, how important is it uh, for you to have that community behind you? Yeah, man, it it it's massive because um, uh, and there's probably a lot of guys in the mix of those right that really don't 
they don't need therapy, but they, they, they might down the road if they don't have that connection, if they're not part of that, uh, you know, um, part of that team. Yeah. So they might, but yeah, man, those are good. Those are good things. Those are really good things. It, I think it's the, the tough part of those, um, is, um, pe- people don't want to people with problems. They don't seek that shit out. They don't, it, 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 it takes somebody like you, like me, you know, to reach out to other guys and say, Hey man, how you doing? And then recognizing the signs and symptoms, you know, of depression, of PTS, of those kind of things. Yeah. And then kind of trickling them into this, you know, without um, taking them by the hand, without flat out suggesting it. Yeah. You know, you could, you could bring it up as a part of a conversation. You know, like, you know what you'd be, you'd be uh, interested in is this thing <laughs> because they do this and you've, you're so talented here and there and you probably should get back into it. You know, you should probably get back into motocross, yeah. you know, those kind of things. So yeah, very important. I'm glad those, those organizations exist. Uh, and to, to wrap up this, uh, chat that we've had uh my, my final sort of question is you, you you've had a lot of chapters in your life so far what does the next chapter look like because obviously you're, you're a person that strategizes and plans i'm sure you've already got the next chapter planned out so what does that look like yeah you, you know to tell you the truth i i do not have the next chapter planned out <laughs> oh well wow. no um i um i'm at a point right now where uh I, I so i still ooze um curiosity and cre- uh creativeness right creativity i still ooze those and um i'm never going to stop doing those now i have found myself in a unique position and it just happened i didn't plan it at all but what am i doing right now uh, it's like social media and stuff yeah. i am making people better people and i don't i don't know how it happened i don't know i tell my wife all the time so i don't know what i'm doing and she says, just keep doing it. So this is my plan for right now is to continue making people better people because it's like a calling. I didn't know that I had this calling or this mission in life. So I am, I have an obligation and I'm going to keep doing this thing. So it's the, uh, you know, with the basic dude stuff, with the workout, with doing podcasts like this, just with chatting with people, you know, spreading enthusiasm, positivity, because there's too much too much negativity out there yeah. negativity is volatile and it's uh it can be you know uh malignant and yeah. so i am um i'm going to continue with my mission i don't know where it came from or how i have been assigned this mission but i accept it with great humility and um i will continue and and i have to figure out other ways to um to spread my to spread my word <laughs> <laughs> well thank you very much for coming on the show it's been absolutely brilliant and a pleasure speaking to you your enthusiasm is infectious uh i hope anybody who's listening or watching to this will uh take on board what you've said so right thank on. you very much for coming on indeed thanks brother appreciate it man 